356, the words of Jesus. I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think I have come to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say it's going to rain. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say there will be scorching heat. And it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky. But why do you not know how to interpret the present time? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Let's pray. God, help us to receive something of the good news, even from this very difficult text, these hard words of Jesus. Help us to make a little more sense of them in the next few minutes so that we might leave here a different kind of people. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, you know why I read this text for this Sunday? Because I had to. It's an electionary. <laughs> Do you think I would ever preach something like this? Um, uh, pick it, you know. It's, it definitely does not warm the cockles of your heart, does it? <laughs> it's a little scary. Divisive. Jesus. Was this Jesus on a bad day? I mean, what's going on here? I thought Luke said Jesus was the Prince of Peace. I thought... Luke had all these stories about, about Jesus being a unifier. I thought just a few weeks ago I preached on Jesus rebuking James and John for wanting to throw fire on that community that rejected them. And now Jesus is talking about division and fire and wishing he could start that fire and calling these people hypocrites. No, I wouldn't have chosen this if I'd, if I'd had the you know, chance to. But I didn't want to back down. I didn't want to back down from this gospel. So what does it mean? My first temptation when I read something like this, these hard words sometimes that Jesus says, is to sort of try to explain them away. It's kind of like, I don't know, like polit uh, presidential candidates who say things and their surrogates come up and say, well, what they meant to say was this. You know, kind of water it down and make it not seem um, like it feels like battery acid to me. Some, you know, but uh, no, I don't want to do that. Um, another temptation we might have with the text like this is to go, go get them. Let's... Let's divide this thing up. Almost enjoying the fact that Jesus said this so that I can look down on my nose at people who believe differently than me or who act differently than me. A lot of people take it that way. Barbara Brown Taylor, though, warns against something like this. She says, When you reduce your faith to believing that God hates the same people you do, you've created a God in your own image. Um, so no, I don't want to go that, I don't want to go that route. Because texts like this have led to people killing other people, doing harm to other people, and they use this as an excuse uh, to do harm. I hope it doesn't mean that. I don't think it does. Some people might say, you know what? Jesus is saying that we run for the hills and get away from this terrible society, this world, and go, go off and go hide. The reason I don't like that avenue is because Jesus himself did his ministry out in the open. He shared his life and his love with everybody in the streets, in the temple, and everywhere that people gathered. 
I don't see Jesus running for the hills. Therefore, I don't think we should run for the hills either. So here's where I come down on this, on this scripture. When you look at texts like this, you have to pay attention to what goes on before what I just read and what goes on afterwards. So if we do that, if you want to pull out your Bibles, I want to show you a couple of things and it might help us to make a little bit more sense of what he's saying and what is really, I mean, he's really ticked off now. He's angry right now. No doubt about it. First of all, he's close to his demise and he knows what's going to happen in Jerusalem. He knows he's going to have to suffer. This baptism that I have been baptized with, he knows it's not going to be easy. Um, that's the first thing. But the second thing is if you look, you will see um, a couple of things. If I can get it right, let's see. Let me make sure I've got, I'm lost right now. Twelve. I need to find my text again. I can't figure out where I am. 1249. 1249. 12, 40, okay, got it. Okay. So if you go back, okay, so chapter 12, verse 49. If you'll flip backwards <clears throat> and go to chapter 11, you will find out exactly what made Jesus so angry. And we need to, we always need to look and see what exactly made Jesus so angry. It wasn't people who disagreed with him about who God is. It wasn't even people who practiced different things than Jesus did um, in his religion. It was this. Jesus says in chapter 11, verse 42, But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and herbs of all kinds. That kind of means you give to the church and show up to all the potlucks, right? Um, it, but you neglect justice and the love of God. It is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting others. It's fine to go to church. It's great to go to church. It's wonderful to pray. It's, it's awesome to sing the hymns of God. And it's great to keep up with the prayer list. But to what end? To what end? And Jesus says, it is love and it is justice. Go a couple of um, verses later and he says this. Woe also to you lawyers. Lawyers, raise your hand. No, I'm just kidding. It's not about, it's not about, this is, lawyers were different back then. So no, he's not getting mad at the, you know, the attorneys uh, of the world today. But these lawyers were people who interpreted the law, the religious law of the day. Woe to you lawyers. For you load people with burdens hard to bear. And you yourselves do not lift a finger to ease them. You criticize people. You put burdens on them. You ask why they don't live lives as good as you do. And you don't lift one finger to help them out. My friends, that is what made Jesus so angry and frustrated. That's what set him off in our text today. Now let's go after the text for a second and look at a couple of things. If you look in chapter 13, you'll see in verse 10 that he walked into a temple and he healed a woman who was crippled. She was bent over. He healed her. Do you think that people would be celebrating and having a good time? Absolutely not. They asked him, why in the world did you do this on the Sabbath? You're not supposed to work on the Sabbath, Jesus. Now think about this. A woman was healed in God's house. What better time to do it than in the temple? Reminds me of, um, anybody read, um, anybody watch like Bart Simpson back in the day, you know? One day, it was a really, really cold day, um, and they were in church, and it was like below zero that day, and they lost electricity, and man, the preacher was... Um, uh, panicking and everybody, nobody knew what to do because the doors were frozen shut. And Bart's little sister was so nervous that she bowed her head and started praying the Lord's Prayer. And Bart looked at her and said, this is neither the time nor the place. <laughs> right there in church. Right there in church. Jesus 
sets a woman free, liberates her solidarity with this woman in temple. And they, oh no you don't. You don't heal in the, on the Sabbath. Says it, rule 123, section 25, letter A in the code. Jesus, you violated and you sinned. They didn't even get that the power of God was at work even when it was right in front of their face on the Lord's day. Jesus said, you know when a cloud goes up, what is it? Sailors of uh, uh, red sky at morn, sailors be warned, red sky at night, sailors delight. You can, you can, look, you can watch TV and see the weather and you know what to wear. You know when the rains are coming based on the direction of the wind, but you do not even know you're blind to the fact that my power and my love is right before you. This is not a new idea by Jesus. He's pulling from the greatest leaders, kind of like the Hebrews that are ready to ki kids. He's pulling from prophets who said time and time again, this is what God says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I don't care if you come before me with bulls. I don't care if you have a great anthem. Although I like anthems, Phil. We all like anthems. I don't care if you've got the most awesome piano and musicians in the world. If you don't have mercy, you've got nothing. But if you've got mercy, you've got everything. You see, sometimes Jesus needed to be a troublemaker. And Jesus did draw a red line. You know what those red lines are? That's kind of a political statement. Red line, you do this, I'm doing that. Non-negotiable, you step over this line, right? He was draw, drawing a line in the sand. The line in the sand was between the arrogant and those who had everything, but did not want to give their lives for those who had nothing. And on the other side of that line was those who saw the power of God at work in their hands and in their love and their mercy. Jesus was a troublemaker because sometimes following Jesus is trouble. It looks crazy, it looks like a waste of time, and it looks very unproductive. And you know, sometimes it's even offensive to people that you would reach out and care for the last and the lost and the least. And Jesus says, do it anyway. Do it whether it brings you praise or scorn. Find ways to give your life away. Be compassionate, Jesus says, as God is compassionate. If you're going to draw that red line, if you're going to draw that red line, draw it between compassion on one side and apathy on the other. And make sure you're on that other side. Because no matter how crazy this world is, calls it. It's like when we turn ourselves to loyalty to Christ and to that kind of life, we're turning our back on other things. To say yes to someone is to say no to someone else. To put one thing as number one in your life is to say there's nothing else that fits that bill. And Jesus says it's, it's not about looking religious or being pious. It is about sharing the love of Christ with others. That is the red line of Jesus Christ. And so, our troublemaker, the one whom we follow, is stirring up trouble in our world and inside us. But what we'll find is that the life that Jesus is calling us to lead is worth the trouble. What's your red line? What are your non-negotiables? And do they match what Jesus is calling us to draw? It's the question for this week. That's the best I can do with this text. <laughs> Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and I promise you, everything else will fall into place. Let's pray. Lord God, you're, you're stirring up trouble in our midst. Not only in our lives, but in our hearts. For in a world of competing loyalties, you call us to turn only to you. 
In a world where we're invited to point our fingers at others and to blame other people, you're inviting us not to judge but to love. And we confess that is a difficult thing. Help us to increase our trust in you so that we might have the courage to step across the red line. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.